Hey everyone, Matt Brunig here. I wanted to comment on this Nepo baby story, which seemed to kind of take the internet by storm last week. Uh, it was based on this cover from New York Magazine. Uh, it was a, the cover story is by Nate Jones, and they, they kind of title it here, Oh, look, she has her mother's eyes and agent, extremely overanalyzing Hollywood's Nepo baby boom. And the story is just all about how the kids of famous actors and directors are getting jobs in Hollywood and how it has always been such. And, you know, this was not surprisingly a big viral hit. You're mixing big megastars that everyone knows about, this kind of cutesy cover, um, and, and, and mixing it all together with a, a major social issue around social mobility and the fairness of the economy and things like that. So... Not a surprise that it was a huge hit. With that said, I was a little bit disappointed, I would say, with some of the shallowness of the discourse uh, around it. I think people know a lot, people talk frequently about nepotism, or at least things that are, if not nepotism directly, things that are adjacent to nepotism, and there's this sort of kind of um, gut sense that it's unfair and wrong and then then you just kind of move from there. But I don't feel like people have really thought deeply about nepotism, about social mobility, about inequality. Um, And certainly they, they don't have a good sense of how common it is for people to follow in the footsteps of their parents, not just for rich people, um, but for people all up and down the ladder and in all kinds of occupations um, across the board. So to get a sense of that, um, I wanted to show you this story from 2017 at the New York Times. Uh, The title of the story is, The Jobs You're Most Likely to Inherit from Your Mother and Father. And the kind of headline uh, number here is that working sons of working fathers are, on average, 2.7 times as likely as the rest of the population to have the same job, and two times as likely to have the same job uh, as their working mothers. Um, And we see here kind of how these numbers play out overall. A son is 2.7 times as likely to have um, the same job as their dad, two times as likely to have the same job as their mother, as the rest of the population, right? And then for uh, women, not quite as uh, tight, but still 1.7 times as likely, 1.8 times as likely. Uh, And they even break it down by different occupations, which is interesting, right? So here's daughters. If uh, uh, If you're a woman and your your father... Uh, was a fisher, you're 360 times as likely to be a fisher than uh, uh, other people are. Um, if, the, if your dad was a librarian, you're a 106 times as likely to be a librarian as other uh, people are. For lawyers, it's 27 times, doctors, 19 times. And, you know, the same thing here. If, uh, if you're a woman and your mother was a dishwasher, you're 91 times as likely to be a dishwasher. Um, and they do the same thing for sons. So if, you're, if your dad was a drywall installer, you're 136 times as likely to be a drywall installer. Uh, if they were a railroad conductor, you're 94 times as likely. Door-to-door sales, 130 times. And on and on, right? Here, even hairdressers. If your mother was a hairdresser and you're a, a son, you're 26 times as likely to be a hairdresser, bartender. Th- I mean, we could go on and on, right? So kids following their parents' footsteps into the labor market is widespread. Um, And this, I think, even understates the extent of it because they're only comparing people who have literally the same occupation as their parent. But if you take, for instance, drywall here, a son is 136 times as likely uh, to be a drywall installer if their father was. I would bet that this number is also really high for professions that are similar to drywall or adjacent in some way, whether that's, um, you know, any kind of building trade, electrician, roofing, uh, installing subfloors, uh, carpentry, whatever, all right? I, 
Um, and of course, we see that in the Nepo baby piece as well, because they they kind of take Hollywood as a whole. But obviously, if your if your father was a director and you then go on to become an actor, you're not actually doing the same occupation. You're just kind of doing an adjacent occupation. So, uh, but I bet that's you know. If you, if you expand the scope a little bit of, of occupational similarity, you probably see this even more uh, people following the footsteps of their parents than is detected in this uh, particular um, measurement. Um, and, you know, the question I want to pose on this, which I feel like is not uh, thought out very well in the discourse, is... Why should we care? Why do we think this is bad? Why do we think it's bad that if dad was a drywall installer, I decided to also be a drywall installer? Or my dad was a lawyer, and I decided I also wanted to be a lawyer, and then I went out and did it, and whatever, right? Why do we think this is bad? Because in almost every other context, we don't think it's bad when kids follow in the footsteps of their parents. In fact, we think it's great. We think it's something to celebrate. Um, it's uh, the preservation of tradition and culture, and it's important for all sorts of reasons, right? So to give some examples, um, people fall in the, follow in the footsteps of their parents when it comes to food. That's a huge thing in food. Every single thing I ever watch on TV about food. It's all people just being like, my mom taught me this and my grandma taught me this and we all, you know, I, I have uh, uh, barbecue runs in my blood, you know, kind of thing, right? People are proud of cooking the same food that their parents cooked and remaining in those same kind of culinary traditions. Um, you see it with uh, leisure activities, you see, oh, my dad, he used to take me uh, to national parks all the time. We were going hiking all the time, and now I'm a big outdoors guy. You know, I, I love and I take my kids outdoors, and it's great. And I think about my old pops, you know, from back in the day. People love that. They eat that shit up, right? They don't talk about uh, hobby mobility, <laughs> right, or hobby nepotism and, and say, oh, that's bad, right? Um, people cheer for the same sports teams as their parents. They, you know, I mean, that's sort of the stuff of life is that these things are intergenerationally transmitted. Yet, when occupations are intergenerationally transmitted, that is seen as uh, a self-evident uh, horror, right? A self-evident bad that needs some kind of rectification. And why? Why is that? Now, I know, I think, the answer for why that is, and that is because uh, in the society we currently live in, in the economy we currently live in, your labor market outcome m means everything. It determines everything about your life. It determines whether you are upper class or not everything about your life, but I mean, determines a large portion of your life, whether you're upper class, middle class, or lower class, what kind of power you have, what kind of respect you have, what kind of prestige you have, um, how people regard you when they just meet you as a stranger. It determines, hell, like what clothes you wear <laughs> during the day, it, right? All this stuff, all the stuff of social stratification, status, money, power, wealth, all that stuff is tied up in your labor market outcome, which part of the labor market you happen to go into. And since that stuff is so important, we kind of cringe at the idea that, well, people just kind of follow in the footsteps of their parents when they go in the labor market because now we're like, oh no, that's not good because that just means that every generation is just gonna, we're just gonna have the intergenerational transmission of class and the intergenerational transmission of inequality. And that's bad. And like, we need to stop that. And like, it is, it is in a way bad that that occurs, right? You can see like there's a legitimate reason to be upset about that. But are you upset? I guess I would ask people uh, to, you know, ask themselves to think hard about that. Are you upset about people following their parents' footsteps in the labor market? Are you upset about the way we do the labor market? Are you upset about the way that 
the fact that when you do follow your steps in your parents, it has all these massive implication, uh, implications for where you wind up in the social hierarchy, right? Because it doesn't have to, right? Because again, remember, none of those other things do. If you cook the same food that your parents cooked, that doesn't have a huge impact on what it means for you in society. If you do the same hobbies your parents did, that doesn't have a huge impact on what your position is in society, your status, where you, where you wind up in social stratification. On and on down the line, it's only the labor market where that happens. And so maybe your problem is not with the intergenerational transmission of certain characteristics, including occupations, but your problem is with the labor market and maybe even in parentheses here with capitalism <laughs> and the way that capitalism puts such a huge emphasis and hangs so much of each person's life on where they happen, what kind of occupations they happen to go into. And I, there was a paper that sort of touched on this from 2016 that I, I think about all the time just because of how crazy the underlying ideological viewpoints of the authors appear to be. You know, this is an economics paper. It's not like a theory paper per se. And so always the ideology is kind of subterranean. You have to pull it out based on what they seem to be worried about. Um, and it's, it, it's someone that just completely takes the bait entirely on the idea that social mobility is a self-evidently, and not just social mobility, but occupational mobility, right? That occupational mobility is a self-evident good, and if you're not getting that, then, then it's, it's, you know, you have some problem that needs to be solved. Um, so we have this paper from Rasmus Landerso and James Heckman. It's titled The Scandinavian Fantasy, The Sources of Interge Intergenerational Mobility in Denmark and the U.S., we have, the, um, we have the abstract here. Measured by income mobility, Denmark is a more mobile society, but not when measured by educational mobility. Greater Danish income mobility is largely a consequence of redistributional tax and transfer and wage compression policies, while Danish social policies for children produce far more favorable cognitive test scores for disadvantaged children. These do not translate into more favorable outcomes partly because of disincentives to acquire education arising from the redistributional policies that increase the income mobility. This bit right here is um, extremely flimsy, but it's funny that that's where they go with it. Um, but anyways, I mean, you know, I'm not going to go through the paper. It's 73 pages and it's just, it's, it's almost all math. Um, but I mean, the basic gist of it is Yes, when people point to Denmark and say that's a, they have a lot more social mobility than the U.S., they are correct insofar as you just measure uh, income mobility, right? So if you say, how far away does the average kid stray from their parents' income growing up? And it's true that the, the Danish kids are more likely if they grew up you know, in the bottom third to wind up in the top third, or if they grew up in the middle half to wind up in the top 25% or if they grew up in the top third to you know see what I'm saying so there's a lot more movement up and down the income distribution but what he finds is that the only reason that's that happens is because Denmark has massively shrunk the income distribution right so the gap between low low wage work and high wage work has been shrunk radically by their uh, unions and then on top of that they have high taxes and the welfare state, which shrinks things even more. So they just squeeze everybody close together. And when you do that, the uh, rungs of the ladder, if you will, uh, become very close together. So the, the difference between the 25th percentile and the 50th percentile is just very close together. So just kind of through a sort of random sorting of people, you're much more likely to get someone to move up 20, 30 percentiles when the gap between those percentiles is just very, very tiny. But when the gap between the percentiles are huge, the odds of someone moving up and down the ladder um, measured that way are just are much lower. Um, but he's just saying, but that's, but what he's saying is that's, that's different than what people normally think. Because when we talk about social mobility in the U.S., what we're talking about is that poor kid who got an education and then he became a doctor or a lawyer or whatever. He's saying that's not really what happens in Denmark. 
And from there, he he treats that as if it, as if that's a self evident problem. And then he also goes on to try to explain that the reason that occurs is because is because things are so equal that kids just don't have any motivation to move up, right? So the poor kids in Denmark, not poor, they're not poor, but like the lower class kids in Denmark, they are hugely benefited by the welfare state and by these services, including early childhood education, whatever, like their cognitive ability is better. Like it does work in a narrow sense that they get smarter and become like more educated, at least in like K through 12 education. But then they still just go on and, and, and follow in the footsteps of their parents when it comes to the labor market. And he's like, that's cheating. <laughs> and, um, y- you know, it's a funny conclusion because on the he doesn't quite see it, but his solution, the implied solution is that Denmark needs to like increase inequality and poverty in society because that'll light a fire under the ass of these poor kids. And instead of them saying, I don't know, I'll just do what dad did, they'll be like, I got to become a lawyer or a doctor or a highly paid professional because I can't live like this, right? Um, but I think he's also just wrong about why kids follow in the footsteps of their parents in Denmark, the more likely outcome is the same one we have here, right? It's not that kids are sitting there and saying, hmm, why be a lawyer when I could just be a truck driver like dad? It's not like lawyers make all that much more than dad makes, you know? They only make a little bit more, so, well, who cares? I'm just not even going to try. That's how he wants to depict it. I would say the more likely (laughs) uh, reason why kids are following the footsteps is is this one right? Um, Because they grew up around it and they want to do things that they saw their parents do. You know? And what's so bad about that? The reason it's bad is because of the inequality. But if you're Denmark and you have shrunk the inequality, it's really not that bad anymore. Right? And like I said before, we don't care about people... Uh, a lack of uh, culinary mobility, the fact that people cook the same foods that their parents and grandparents and so on cooked. We don't care about a lack of, you know, the stickiness of all sorts of things that are passed down generations. Not only do we not care about them, we celebrate them, we love them, it's great. It's The only reason we care about this one is because of the massive inequality between professions, which instead of shrinking it, we've decided in our society that we're just going to try to make it so, well, if, if at least it's a fair game. It's a fair game to see whether you wind up in desperate poverty or just, just disgustingly rich. It's a, as long as it's a fair game, then that's, that's the way you solve that. And it's like, no, just shrink it. And then you don't even have to care if boilermakers if sons of boilermakers become boilermakers or if sons of lawyers become lawyers or if daughters of actresses become, you don't, who, why, who who cares? It doesn't matter, right? Because the income differences, they're, they're so tiny. Who cares? That's the solution we should be reaching for, it seems to me. Now, the other thing I'd say here is, you know, so far I've been talking about uh, people following in the footsteps. And of course, that's not really what people generally think about when they think about nepotism. I would say, for the most part, people like to think that the reason why kids wind up in the same professions or uh, as their parents is because parents are pulling strings and using their connections. And obviously that occurs, but it does seem like probably a lot of it is not that, right? A lot of it is just kids grow up around it. They learn a lot about it. They become interested in it. Again, the same reason why kids cook the same uh, uh, food that uh, their, their Nana taught them, right? Um, but even on the connection side, because the connection side is where it seems people are like, hey, that's not right. That seems like self-evidently uh, immoral, you know, that people are pulling strings like it's unfair. And I get that. And I'm not even going to push, I'm not even going to say that that's I don't want to make a strong move against it in the same way that I did with the rest of this video, but I would just pose a few questions about it, right? What kind of society do you want to live in? Do you want to live in a society where friends don't help friends get work? Friends don't help friends get jobs where parents don't help kids? You know, that seems like you're really sacrificing a lot of important social connections in service of 
the bullshit labor market you've set up, right? Like the labor market thing that you've set up in which it determines almost everything about your life and the, the differences are so massively unequal that it's so important that which one you, you've allowed the, uh, uh, the bad way that you've constructed your economic system to slap all the way back to you saying, oh, helping your friends and family, that's suspicious. You shouldn't do that. It's actually really unfair to other people. I don't know. I would like maybe to maintain a little bit of some of the bonds that people have in which they help uh, their friends and family. Like that's that seems like an important institution in society, the helping the friends and family <laughs> institution. And it would seem uh, both impractical and also bad to sacrifice the helping friends and family institution of society in service of this god-awful labor market system we have and trying to somehow make that fair by saying, well, as long as everyone has an equal roll of the dice at it, then it's somehow fair. I, w I, would, I would much prefer to go the other route where we just make your labor market outcome more or less irrelevant. Like just make it to where it doesn't really matter, then okay, who cares? Sometimes friends get jobs for friends, sometimes family get jobs for family. Um, kids like to follow in the footsteps of their parents. Uh, well, so what? That's life. It doesn't have to have a big social meaning or economic meaning. It doesn't have to have any of that. It happens to have all of that. But that could be changed. And that's where the problem is. It's not in the following in the footsteps. It's not in the helping of friends and family. It's in the construction of a system that makes the impact of that massive and radically alters the trajectory of your life based on it, right? But we could fix that and we should. So that's kind of my slightly perhaps off-kilter take on the Nepo baby stuff. Curious to see what you think. Sound off in the comments.